Aren't you thankful that he said a few things? Aren't you thankful that he said that by my stripes you are healed? Aren't you thankful that he said I am the way, the truth, and the life? Aren't you thankful that he said that if you believe in me and if you open the door to me, I'll come in and sup with you and you with me? There are so many things that he said. And oh, what a comfort they bring. What an assurance they bring. The old songwriter simply penned these words, blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. How many knows that we have a song tonight because of who Jesus is? I'm so grateful for it this evening. Well, may the Lord bless you tonight. Thank you for braving the cold and the little bit of weather we had today to be in the house of the Lord this morning as well as this evening. Allow me to welcome our online audience tonight. May the Lord bless you where you are today. We are so grateful that you're with us this evening as well. And uh, this is an exciting time to serve the Lord. Amen. For the rest of you, we'll pray that you get excited. I had two amens in the building. I am grateful that I am alive at this time. Amen. It is a wonderful day. This is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. But I also will understand that because of the hour and season we're in, it is one of the greatest days to be alive because we are preparing for his return. Amen. It is exciting days to be living in. Well, tonight, I am glad that you're here. So good to see my friend Carl back with us tonight as well. God bless you, my friend. So wonderful to have Pastor Phil with us and back up moving, not under the weather anymore. So glad that he's here and glad his hair's growing back. So when his hair gets a little bit longer, then he gets his strength back and he's anointing back. We're going to let him preach on a Sunday night. But we're going to make sure he gets off the grinding wheel and says, Lord, lead me to the pillars one more time. So maybe we'll see. Maybe that'd be next Sunday evening. I'm not sure. We'll see what his schedule is. Uh, but so glad he's in the house. And we'll let him maybe pray with us and greet you uh, in just a, a little bit. But tonight, I want to jump into the word of the Lord with you tonight. I am... You know, Excited that I didn't run everybody off this morning, so that's always a good thing. And so, but I pray that we had ears to hear and hearts to receive the word of the Lord this morning. I do believe it's a it's a word from the Lord for you and I, uh, as well as the body of Christ across the globe. But I believe that we're in a very very critical hour, but it is a good hour as well if we will awaken to our responsibilities. But tonight, it may sound like it's doom and gloom at the beginning, but I promise it's not. But I do believe that tonight, I do have a word of, that I want to share with you that the Lord has brought in my spirit. And it is not a word to condemn us, but it is a word to awaken us to the reality of where we find ourselves today. I recently read a quote, and this quote said, The moment that you let your courage leave you, you turn into an old abandoned house. How many knows that an old abandoned house isn't in good condition? Wade can testify. He's been working on one that was abandoned for three years, and he's still got a ways to go, but it's looking beautiful. But I, I want that to sink in before we really get into this word tonight. The moment you let your courage leave you, you turn into an abandoned old house. Think about it. That's a little bit sobering. Now, I'm not going to bring the Tootsie Rose back out tonight and let you see how long you got left to live. That might depress some of you. I'm not going to do that to you. But I want you to turn in your Bibles to one verse this evening, Ecclesiastes chapter number 10, verse number 18. And for a few moments, I want to deal with the subject tonight on the decaying house. The decaying house. I'm going to read one verse, and then I'm going to go to several other passages of Scripture. But for us tonight, I'm going to read in our hearing this one verse and take our text from there. Ecclesiastics chapter number 10. You'll find it immediately following the book of Proverbs in your Bible. Verse number 18. It says, By much slothfulness the building decayeth, 
and through idleness of the hands, the house droppeth through. I'd like to give you this same passage in the Amplified Bible. It reads such as this. Through laziness, the rafters decay and the roof sags. And through idleness, the roof of the house leaks. Makes you want to shout, don't it? Just stay with me tonight for a few moments. If the Lord would help me, I want to deal with the subject, the house that is decaying. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we love you tonight. We thank you once again for your word. We thank you for your precious people tonight that's in this building as well as those that's taking time to join us wherever they may be tonight. And Lord, on this cold winter evening, Lord, I pray that you would speak to our hearts. Let a passion be reignited in us. Let vision be granted to us. And Lord, I pray that a fresh infilling of the Holy Spirit would come to all of us in Jesus' name. And the church says, amen and amen. For a a little while tonight, the house that is decaying is our subject. If something is in the process of decaying, it can be said that it is in the decomposing process. Meaning it is no longer in the state that it was originally in. Please notice, means it is no longer in a state of excellence, prosperity, health, or etc. All around us today, we are witnessing things that are decaying. In the natural today, even within our own city, like many other cities, we could take a ride through our streets and we would find some abandoned buildings that used to be full of life. Especially in our manufacturing district, you will find that there is many buildings that are setting with boarded windows and boarded doors with torn off roofs and all types of grown up parking lots and weeds coming through places that they should never be. They used to be a place that employed many, and it was a place that was vibrant and full of life. And if you would have drove by there in the morning, in the afternoon, or even in the midnight hours, you would hear laughter, you would hear voices, you would see movement. There was things that made you aware that life was present. But today, as we go by them, there is nothing more than a few critters running here and there that is simply eating away at the structure Often what happens first of all will be the roof that goes on a building that is abandoned. As water begins to come into that place, it begins to create the decaying process. And it isn't long until things begin to deteriorate very quickly. A building that stood for many years, once it is abandoned, begins to to decay very quickly. Not only can we talk about abandoned buildings, but we can also talk about homes that used to be breathtaking. Children used to run and play in the yards. Uh, Cookouts was happening on the back lawn. Everything once used to be much differently than it is today. We also can take this conversation into the world of automobiles. Those that used to be sitting on the showroom floor, sparkling, not a scratch in them, but now they're sitting down at Glen Reds or somewhere else in our community, and there's nothing left of them. They have been picked over, and everything that could be stripped from them has been taken from them. They are sitting in a state of decomposing. As much as we can talk about all of these things, can I tell you, We can talk about city after city, community after community. We can talk about the coal mines and all of the things around us in our nation. And we can say it used to be, but now it's much differently. As heartbreaking and as disturbing as some of these things are, they come nowhere near the disappointment that we have concerning the current condition that we now see. And please understand the difference that we now see the church world in. I am not talking about the remnant. I'm not talking about the church of Jesus Christ because today there is a church without spot, without blemish. And if today was the day and he said, it is time to go get your bride, there is a bride that is ready. But much of what the world sees is not that bride, but they see a church world that has lost its way. 
Now, I'm not here to be negative. I'm not here to point fingers. But what I'm saying is this. While we have witnessed the blessings of God, especially here in America and other Western nations, we now see while we have made great gains within the church, we have also at the same time lost some of the most precious and most needful things for reaching the harvest. We currently have a form, but we have no power. We have gifts, but we have no anointing. We have things, but we have no peace. Paul warned of a time that would come, such as this, as he was writing some of his final words in 2 Timothy chapter number 3. The first five verses of that chapter, as he's writing to Timothy, this is what he pens. This know also, that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, fierce despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. But then this is some of the most important words he ever penned to a young man. From such turn away. The reason I bring this to our attention tonight is because many innocent individuals that are searching for answers for their issues are looking to this house and expecting to find something, but yet they just continue to witness more of the same things that they already have. Brokenness, disappointment, fear, uncertainty, and hopelessness. I have to say tonight to you and I as men and women of God, this is the result of slothfulness. Please hear me. To be slothful means to be sluggardly or to be lazy. You're not going to shout me down again tonight. It's all right. Because before we can shout, we got to have a reason to shout. So you may misunderstand what's been taking place over the last few weeks and last month in this house, but what it is, it's God preparing us for something great. There has to be repentance before there can be revival. There has to be awakening before there can be a great move of God. Can I tell you today, God is doing something much deeper than what we understand on the surface. Please stay with me. We are taught in the scripture that if someone is to be considered virtuous, there is one thing that they cannot eat of. Please hear me. If you was to go to your Bibles and read Proverbs chapter 31, it talks about a virtuous woman. Talks about how wonderful she is. Talks about if you can find a virtuous woman, she is far greater than anything that the world has to offer. Basically, I'm paraphrasing. But when you begin to go through that passage of Scripture, and you get down to verse 27, there's a verse I want to give you tonight from that. She looketh well to the ways of her household and eateth not the bread of idleness. Now, hear me. The truth of the matter, we have failed to teach the importance of spiritual and physical. Don't fall out of your chair. Hang on to it. Labor. For the kingdom. If you don't work, this is what we're always told. If you don't work, you don't eat. The government will eventually run out of money. You may be eating now, but you're not going to eat forever. You hear me. If you don't work, you're not going to eat. Not just in the natural, but the same principle applies spiritually. If you don't work, if you don't labor, you're not going to eat. It's been provided for us, but somebody's got to labor. Somebody's got to get it to you. May I, I, can I tell you, let me back up just for a moment. We have allowed men to sit idle. And because of the seat of comfort that we have allowed men and women to sit in, in, in the body of Christ, we now are reaping the results of that. And we have a decaying house. Meaning this, that the church world is no longer attractive. You say, oh, but it, it, it is attractive. And once it's, listen, there are those that's going for a moment, but they're not staying. Because they go for a season, 
But then it just becomes something else on their calendar because they're not experiencing the power and the anointing of God where they experience true freedom and they get back to this mindset. After the newness wears off, well, nothing's changed, nothing different. It's just one less thing on my calendar. I'll go back to do what I was doing. Hear me. May I remind us of the danger that we face in this hour. John chapter 10, verse number 10. The thief cometh not but for to steal, to kill, and destroy. Just because you say I'm a Christian does not mean that you and your family is exempt from his tactics. But there is an enemy tonight that wants to steal, kill, and destroy you, your marriage, your children, your grandchildren, your community, your nation, uh, as well as the nations of the world. Uh, listen, my friend, uh, we are engaged in a spiritual battle. While we know the price for freedom of de deliverance has already been paid, it does the world no good unless they are made aware of it. One of the greatest dangers that we have today is that we just assume everybody knows. But can I tell you, not everybody was taken to Sunday school like you was. Not everybody had a praying grandma or grandpa like you did. Not everybody had a mom or a dad that took them to the house of the Lord. But we are in a society today that does not know who Jesus is, uh, nor do they know the mighty works that he's done. Uh, they don't know about Calvary. Uh, they don't know about Pilate's Hall. Uh, they don't know about the stripes that he bore on his back. Uh, they don't know about a crown of thorns that was plated on their head. Uh, they don't know these basic principles of God's word. Uh, but can I tell you, uh, we have got to make sure that a generation uh, has a, an exposure uh, not to a church world, uh, but to a true relationship with a man named Jesus. Amen. Romans chapter 10, verse 13 through 15. Notice it says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, shall be saved. And then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed. And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of priests and bring glad tidings of good things. This clearly shows us that we have been given a responsibility to go and to tell. You say, well, thank God I'm not a preacher. Let me correct that for you real quickly before I go any further. We are all ambassadors for the kingdom. You hear me? An ambassador takes a message of another and goes and tells. I'm sorry. Look at your neighbor and tell him, you're a preacher. Oh, you ain't going to shout me down tonight. Notice, Jude chapter 1, verse 3, through the following. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to, uh, uh, diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Notice this. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. I will therefore put you in remembrance, though you once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterwards destroyed them that believed not, and the angels, which kept not their first estate, but was left to their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day, as well as even Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. You say, well, how in the world is all this going to fit together? Stay with me. We are given three examples in this short passage of Scripture of the results of the sin of idleness. I didn't forget where we started. Let me give it to you one more time. By much slothfulness, the building decayeth, and through idleness of the hands, the house droppeth through. Now notice, Israel was destroyed because they become idle. We find that the angels became idle. 
What do you mean by that? They quit doing the work of the Lord and they began to do things as they wanted to do. And God began to bring devastation to them. And then we find Sodom was burned with fire. I don't have time to deal with all three of these, but I would like to deal with one of these tonight. I want to ask you a question. How did Sodom and the areas around it become so lost? How did they end up that way? We find the answer to that question in your Bible. In Ezekiel chapter number 16, verse number 49, notice this. Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom. Pride, fullness of bread, and an abundance of idleness was in her and in her daughters. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor or the needy. Now, let me take a moment to unpack this. We see where it all began. Sodom began to be filled with pride. It was filled with more than enough bread. And thirdly, it had an abundance of idleness. And therefore, it no longer saw the need to take for and strengthen the hand of the poor and the needy. It became turned selfishly upon itself. Notice pride, fullness of bread, and abundance of idleness. May I be so bold to say to you, we are witnessing here in the United States of America, men and women, as well as a church world, that is following into the same trap that was laid for Sodom by the enemy. We currently are witnessing the rise of pride in the hearts of men. What does that mean, preacher? Many now believe that we, the human race, are equal to God. We hear all sorts of false teachings been spewed from the platform of the American church today. This week alone, I heard a minister publicly say this, we need a new gospel. He's very charismatic. He has a large platform. He has thousands of people following him. I think when he said, I can say one thing to this group, but if I'm dealing with another group, the 30 year olds, I have to have a new gospel for them because they, I can't expect them to adhere to what I'm telling this group. Really? What he's simply saying is, I know more than what God says, I'm full of pride. The same time I hear that, I heard another minister say this. Hell is not really for eternity. Hell is not really how we, it's not figurative the way that we think it is. There is a day that it will no longer be. Really. I believe my Bible says something quite differently than that. Not only are we filled with pride, hear me. There's a few things that God hates, and pride is one of them. What is pride? Pride is lifting or puffing yourself up in such a manner, saying, I've got it all figured out. This is wrong, but I am right. I've come to the conclusion, when I read this and I don't agree with that, both of us can't be right, and I know I'm not right because he knows more. So that means I have to change. So when you begin to go through this and say, well, I just don't believe it that way. Well, you better start believing it that way if God's revealing some things to you. You do your due diligence. But notice, he, he's the one that is right. Much as you want to be right, much as I want to be right, please hear me. The moment we begin to think that we know better is the moment we begin to be lifted up with pride. Notice with me, pride does what? It comes before a fall. Wonder why our nation's falling today. Wonder why we're seeing week after week after week another scandal from the platforms of the American church. Why? Just asking. Not only are we filled with pride, but we are filled with bread. Now, not only is our natural pantries full today, but please hear me. Our platforms in the American church is throwing out all kinds of bread. We got sweet bread. We got every kind of flavored bread, about like every type of coffee you got out there now. What's ever happened to a black cup of coffee? 
Whatever happened to that? I couldn't even order some of the things you drink. I can't even pronounce the words that some of you use for it. I'm surprised they know what you're saying on the other side of the speaker. They must have the gift of interpretation. Because I'm telling you, it's a, it's a crazy world out there. But what I'm saying to you is this, is when our platforms in America notice we have conference after conference, we have event after event, we have a podcast, we have e-books, we have audio book, we have live stream, we have YouTube, and even for the old timers now, we still do it in book form and we got Barnes and Nobles and we got Amazon. And everybody is producing their latest revelation and their latest prophecy and the people just keep eating. Hear me. Second Timothy chapter four, verse number three, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. I mean, it don't matter how much you learn if you never apply it. You can know all kinds of stuff, but you're never going to do anything with it. You don't need to learn it. But if you're learning something, it better be learned, lined up with what God is teaching, not what men has created. Hear me. Everybody. And then there is this, where I want to be tonight. And then there is idleness. God help us today. Like in Sodom, we see an abundance of idleness. To be idle simply means this, to not be working or to not be active. It means, means to not be in use or to not be in operation. When you and I begin to look at the condition, we notice this. Everybody wants everybody else to take responsibility because I don't want to have to do anything because my schedule is already so busy. I just want to come. I just want to get into the presence of God. I just want somebody to sing it down, blow it down, preach it down. I just need to be fed. Oh, I just need to be fed. Well, I understand we all need to be fed. However, idle hands, hear me now, get us in trouble. What I have witnessed is this, that many people, young and old alike, find themselves in great darkness due to seasons of idleness in their life. When there is no movement, no activity taking place, the enemy comes in and brings enticing things for those who are idle and they begin to partake in things that they should have never had present in their life. Can I tell you, there's some things in the church that does not belong in the church. I know I'm sounding old. That's all right. I can take it. Notice with me. May I remind us that the things of the world does not have a place in the house of God. Please hear me. The most dangerous thing a person can do is to choose to do nothing. I come up with that. I thought that was pretty good. I might make a t-shirt on that one. Please hear me. The most dangerous thing a person can do is to choose to do nothing. When you're idle and you're putting out the welcome mat for destruction and death to come to your house, it does no good to say, oh God, I need you. You're making choices. I know the new era simply teaches us it's all about grace and I'm thankful for grace, but nothing is really required of us is what they say. But our Bible tells us something much differently. Let me take you to Romans chapter 12, verse number one. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present, not anybody else, but you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. But don't stop there. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Can I tell you, that means you got to do something. It means you can't be idle. It means you have to stay moving. You have to stay active. Uh, notice, uh, it goes a little further. Uh, it is our responsibility to present ourselves to him. Old Testament scripture, we read of a man that most of you have heard of. I want to take a few moments and talk to you about him tonight. David comes on the scene in our Bible as a young shepherd boy. Anybody remember that? 
We find that he was anointed by the prophet, uh, and we find that as he was anointed by the prophet to be king, uh, we read of this of these great accounts uh, of encounters that he had. Uh, he said, I had an encounter with a bear once. Can I tell you, he didn't stay idle when he met that bear. He had an encounter with a lion. He didn't stay idle when he encountered that bear, uh, that lion. He then had an encounter with a man named Goliath, and he didn't stay idle at that time either. But he said, is there not a cause? And instead of running away, he ran towards. After man had tried to dress him in everything that he had, he said, I'm sorry, King Saul, but I can't go in these because I've never proved them. But let me go back down to the river and let me get what I know works. Uh, and he went and got him five smooth stones, put them in his shepherd bag, uh, and got his sling. And he said, and he had his staff in his hand, meaning he had his testimony. Uh, he said, the God that delivered me from the bear, from the lion, and now getting ready, I'm getting ready to carve a giant in this thing because God's about to do it again. Uh, because he understood I I can't be idle if I want to have victory. Now hear me. David, we know, has been anointed. We read these great accounts. We see he is even referred to in Scripture as a man after God's own heart. Notice if you read Acts chapter 13, verse 22, it says, And we, when he had removed him, talking about Saul, he raised up unto, him, up to, unto them David to be their king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, notice this is what the word of the Lord is, says concerning David, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. Now, I'd like for him to talk that way about me. I have found Ron. Woo-hoo. Wouldn't you like that? Put your name there. That'd be hard not to be lifted up with pride, right? But David wasn't that way. He was like, I, I have found David. He is a man after my own heart. I watched a story last night of Eric Little. He was a Scottish young man. His parents was missionaries to China. Him and his brother grew up in a boarding school because that's just the way it was back in his day in the early 20s. His parents would come home for a year. They'd be gone for seven. They'd work on the mission field for seven, come home for a year for fur uh, furlough, and then they'd go back, work another seven years. So after they're born, they come, they bring them home because of circumstances in China in the early 20s. And they're home for a year, and by this time they're five, six years old, and they go away for seven years. They come back, and they're with them. They leave again for another seven years. They come back. They had to write to their parents every day. Their parents wrote them continually. So they wasn't abandoned, but yet they was raised in this environment. But they began to have such a passion, such a desire for the people of China. But Eric was a runner. Eric was a powerful runner. He played rugby, loved rugby. But they realized that, you know what, this, this kid's special. He can run like nobody else. And they began to groom him and said, you know what, he'd be a good man. He'd be a good, good man for the Olympics. And one guy began to take interest in him, and they began to develop him. And they said, listen. He said, and, but as this was happening, Eric began to have an encounter spiritually. He began to have a passion for the things of God. And they said, listen, I think we're going to pick you to represent us for the Olympics. It was a little different in the way that they picked then versus now. They waited to the final moments but until there was everybody working and training so hard. They said, we need you to run the 100. But the only problem was the 100 would have ran on Sunday. And he said, I'm sorry, I can't run the 100 because I can't, I, I can't do it because the events is on Sunday and I'm not, going, I'm not going to sacrifice my conviction. It's the Lord's Day. It's the Sabbath. He said, I'm not going to participate. He said, I can't do that. And they said, oh, you've been selfish. They said, you're a shoe in. Nobody can run it like you can. You will give Scotland a gold medal in the hundred. And he says, I'm sorry, I can't do it. They began to have conversations. He said, all right, we'll let you run the 200. And could you possibly run the 400? He began to, he began to practice, began to prepare. He never ran a 400. And he begins uh, this process, and everybody was saying this, all of the world, all of the commentators were saying, oh, 
He just, he's been selfish. He won't give up his Sunday. He could give them a gold medal, but he's not. So he said, we, we don't think he has a chance to even be competitive in the 400, a little along the 200. said, so we just don't think he can. He was going to his event for the 400. I'll fast forward for the sake of time. Somebody sent and wrote him, an out, uh, wrote him a little note. And he said, I'll open it when I get to the event. And right before he's getting ready to go run, he opened this and it said, Basically this, that the Lord will favor those that will hold true to their convictions and their, and their commitment to the Lord. It encouraged him. But he took off from the blocks that day at an unbelievable pace. Everybody said this. There's no way he can sustain that. He's going to fade rather quickly. But to their surprise... Not only did he win, but he set a new world record. Everybody went crazy. And they said, oh, what are you going to do? I mean, they began to have parades for him. They, they exalted him. He was 22 years of age. But he never let pride come in. He comes back home, and they said, what are you going to do? He looked, and he simply said this, my heart has began to be turned towards China. So next year, I'm going to go and I am going to work with the people of China. Everybody thought he lost his mind. But he realized this, I can't be idle concerning what God has put in my spirit. And he walked away from the sport that he loved because he knew that the sport was something that gave him a platform to do what he was created to do. He refused to be idle. Stay with me. We find David did not stay idle. We know him to be a worshiper. We know that there's a time where he was a man of restraint because he could have took Saul when they was in the cave. But he said, I will not touch God's man. But then we see he was also a man of war. He had great victories, great battles he had won. And we know him as all of these things. And it looked like things was well. But all of a sudden, something happened to the man that was after God's own heart. He become a man of idleness. Say, how can you say that about him? There's a story in your Bible. And I want us to have ears to hear what God is telling us today. In 2 Samuel chapter number 11... Verse number one, and it come to pass after the year was expired at the time when kings go forth to battle that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all of Israel and they destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged Rabbath, but David tarried still at Jerusalem. David chose to be idle. He chose not to go to battle. And it come to pass in the evening tide that David arose from off his bed and walked up on the roof of the king's house. And from the roof, he saw a woman washing herself. And the woman was very beautiful to look upon. Can I tell you, the devil don't bring you ugly stuff. He brings you beautiful things. And David sent and inquired after the woman, and one said, Is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Elam, uh, the wife of Uriah, the Hittite? And David sent messengers and took her, and she came in unto him. And he lay with her, for she was purified from her uncleanliness, and she returned into her house. And the woman conceived and sent and told David and said, I am with child. You hear me this evening. His sin of idleness caused his house to begin to decay quickly. His decision to be idle placed him in a position to be exposed to something that he should have never saw. There is a generation that has been exposed to things that they should have never seen in the house of God because men and women have chosen the rooftop instead of the battlefield. I, I want you to hear the weight of this message tonight. 
because of his behavior, he positioned his house for destruction instead of blessing. His sin of idleness caused decay to happen so quickly because of his behavior. Not only did he father a child out of wedlock, but he tried to cover up his sin. He sent for Uriah, the husband of Bathsheba, and he tried sending him home to his wife to cover his sin. But Uriah was not a man of idleness. If you read the story, he was a man that was committed to the fight. He said this in verses 8 through 11. He said, how in the world can I go home to my wife and sleep under the comfort of my house uh, when Joab is out there, when all of Israel is out there? He said, I will not go home to a place of luxury and comfort uh, until this battle is won. He's saying this, I will not commit the sin of idleness because uh, I am committed to the cause. Hear me. And we see this response caused David's house to decay even more. They sent word and simply said this, listen, I know that you sent food and you sent Uriah home, but do you realize he laid outside your door all night and he said, I'm not going to go anywhere because there is some things that still has to be done. So David then puts a note in Uriah's hand, says, take this to Joab and notice what happens. Because David is out of control at this time because of being idle, He's not thinking clearly. He's no longer in the will of God. Uh, Yes, he's still anointed king, but he is so far off track uh, that now not only is he trying to cover up his sin, uh, but now this sin is taking him into a dark place that he's never been in this manner before. He says this, uh, take Uriah, put him in the hottest part of the battle, uh, and make sure that death comes to him. And when you read this story, you find that's exactly what happened, uh, that Uriah died on the battlefield because one man decided to be idle and sat at home. Notice what happened. When you read chapter number 11, you will find that David was lying in bed in the evening hours. It wasn't even dark yet, and he's laying in bed slumbering. God help us tonight. There's a word in scriptures that tells us every man is to work while it's yet day because there comes a time when night comes uh, and no man can work. It's not night yet, church. uh, But if you look around, the church is already in bed with Bathsheba and we're wondering why there's no victory, no power, no anointing. Uh, I come to tell somebody on a Sunday night, uh, listen, uh, it's not about what anybody else is doing, uh, but it's about what are you doing. Uh, I'm not being mean tonight, but I'm trying to prop us to a place where we can once again walk with the power and the anointing of God. Uh, Somebody needs delivered. Uh, Somebody needs set free. Uh, Somebody needs a miracle. Uh, Somebody needs healing. Uh, Somebody needs deliverance. Uh, But we can't minister to them uh, if we're laying in the bed of idleness. Uh, God help us tonight uh, to awaken to the reality uh, that we're on the battlefield or we're in the harvest field. Either one. Uh, If you're not fighting, uh, then you're harvesting. Uh, If you're harvesting, uh, then somebody else is fighting for you to bring the harvest. Uh, Listen, uh, Nehemiah said this, uh, I cannot come down to you uh, because I am doing a great work. Uh, This thing is still considered to be a great work, uh, but somebody's got to get mobile again. Notice the sin of idleness turned a man of anointing into a man that was walking after darkness and evil. Notice the one that was recorded as having a heart after God becomes one that's recorded to have been one that displeased the Lord. In verse number 27 of chapter 11, 2 Samuel, it says, David had done this thing and it displeased the Lord. I asked the question today, how pleased is he of us in the American church today? When one chooses to refuse to engage and go to the battlefield, He is choosing to place himself in the crosshairs of the enemy. He will come, become exposed to things that he should not ever see, and his house will begin to decay. Our nation tonight is in a very dangerous moment. We're lifted up with pride, we're filled with bread, and we have an abundance of idleness. 
I understand using wisdom. I understand being sensitive to the needs of the people. And I don't want this to be taken out of context because I'm not trying to be harsh or mean. But if we was to do the analysis today, I would say this. In this region of the United States that had a little bit of weather, probably 80 to 90% of our churches canceled today. But there can be two feet of snow and the world won't cancel. And the church people will still get up and go and sit in bleachers and cheer on their team. And we talk about having revival. We're filled with idleness. Let it sink in tonight. Our lives are filled with the bread of men instead of his body. And it is now that we see the church within our nation sitting idle. No urgency to reach the lost around us, but we're comfortable going through our weekly routines while we continue to see a generation die lost. If, it may, if I may be so bold tonight as they come to the piano, there is a group of people that say they love Jesus that has climbed into bed with Bathsheba. And we, like David, are living in a manner where we're displeasing to our God. And if something doesn't change quickly, and I mean quickly, There is a release of judgment fire coming, not to the world. It will get there eventually. But he says judgment begins at the house of the Lord. You've heard me say this often, where much is given, much is required. There was much entrusted with the church in America. And its leaders, please hear me, has been given much responsibility. It is my responsibility as a local pastor to guard your souls, to guard your life the best that I can. I wish I could preach feel good things all the time. And there's times and season for that. But there's times such as this where I have to issue words of caution words of warning and it's out of a heart of love that I do so tonight and even to those that are watching by way of internet today we are guilty of choosing the rooftop over the battlefield we must awaken and we must repent while there's still an opportunity just like the churches of Asia Minor that you read of in the beginning of the book of Revelation, grace has been extended. And if we'll heed the call of the Lord, as we ministered to just a couple of services back, to anyone that will open the door, he says, I will come in and I will sup with them and they with me. And I will grant them to sit in my throne as I sat in the Father's throne. Romans 5 and 20 says, but, you know, just because sin did abound, he said grace did much more abound. I'm thankful for the grace of God today. But in order for us to open unto him, we must first move from our place of idleness. When you look at the words of warning that was given to the seven churches in Asia Minor, at the end of every one of them, it says simply, this, he that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. And what you see is there was a requirement of movement. He said, I stand at the door and I knock. If any man will open unto me, guess what? If you're moving, you're not idle. If you're hearing the knocking, it means you got to get up from where you're sitting and you got to make movement. You and I today must understand this. 
idle hands produces defeat. All that it takes for evil to prevail is for good men to do nothing. But here's the greatest thing. You and I tonight need to understand. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. So therefore, we don't have to fear. No matter what may come my way, no matter what I may experience, God is greater. And Paul even teaches us that to die is gain. We don't even have to fear death. No matter what we're faced with, the only thing that should bring a disturbance to our spirit is this, a decaying house. When you look around and you see, and I'm not talking about tradition and I'm not talking about styles and method, but you say this, well, it's not like it used to be. That should trouble us greatly. What do I mean by that? Is when I look through time, And I saw the anointing present and the power present where life was transformed and changed. When was the last time that you heard somebody in the sanctuary of the American church begin to weep and cry because the power of the Holy Spirit was so thick in the room and the lost sinner man and woman didn't wait for an altar service but they took out of their seat and they ran to the altar. When was the last time? Is it possible our idleness has caused us to get into a place where that has lifted? When was the last time that you heard what we call a holy hush in the room where babies stopped crying, everything just stilled? Anybody remember those moments? Where the hot wheel cars quit moving under the, under the pew and the baby rattlers quit moving. All of a sudden, the 8-year-old and the 12-year-old lifted their head and took notice what was going on in the sanctuary and they're like, what in the world is this? Why is it that present today? God hasn't changed. We're to a place in our society today that you got hundreds of pastors quitting every month because of the simple fact they can't even get a volunteer to help vacuum the floor in their church. Because we have so much idleness. But I come to tell you tonight, as I shared with you this morning, desire is not enough. There has to be, there has to be some movement on our part. David, surely not David. But when David chose to stay in Jerusalem, Instead of going and fighting the battle. I can firmly believe and say this from my heart. I do not believe that David had any feelings or any ambition towards Bathsheba. He didn't even know who she was. But because he was in a state of idleness and he walked out on his rooftop. And the enemy just had her there right at the wrong time. And immediately things began to happen in his heart that would have never happened. If he'd been where he was supposed to be, he would have never been exposed to that. He had never saw it. The reason we're fighting some of the battles we're fighting in the American church today is because we're in the wrong location. And I'm not talking about that naturally. I'm talking about in the spirit. If you're on the battlefield or in the harvest field, you're not going to see things that's going on on the rooftops of the people around you. But when you choose to be idle... You're choosing to lay out a doormat for destruction and death. We must awaken. And we must understand tonight. For the one that will call on his name, he will hear. And he will respond. And our house doesn't have to decay. 
that our house can be what it's created to be. We can become a light like a city setting on a hill. We can become salt to a lost and dying world. We can become the safe haven, the place of healing, the place of deliverance that God has called us to be. But we have to leave the place of idleness.